So I was asked to do a presentation and I've done presentations for the, the governor's conference for the past few years. And so I usually have a pretty good idea ahead of time what I'm gonna be talking about. So when I volunteered to do this, I think probably back in January or February, we knew the conference was coming up in May. I had an idea what I could do a little bit different from years past and I brought it out. And uh, yep, yeah, that's going to do. I started doing some research to be able to pull it together, and then things have started to happen. So this presentation is a bit of a jumble because at first I thought I was going to be talking about the pros and cons of using technology for self-care, and then it turned out well, this is going to be tough because. I want to sort of talk to people about other things that they can do to manage their self care without necessarily turning to technology. And then we were all told to stay home for three months. And what did we have to connect with the world, to connect with our friends, to, in this case, for me, to be able to do my job in so many different ways, had to use technology. So I really wanted to sort of bring that in and, and you know, recognize that technology is not a bad thing and we're com coming to rely on it more than we ever have in the past. And maybe that's a good thing, but there's still some other things we need to pay, to pay attention to. So I was comparing this as thinking, okay, there are so many people I'd, uh, that had never used Zoom before. And we're really suspicious about Zoom and about giving Zoom information that maybe they Zoom shouldn't have. And, and the same thing with social media. Oh, I don't want to get on social media because people spy on you through social media and all of these things are going on. And, and it, it just reminded me of what happened back when rock and roll came into the world. So I'm going to share with you something that happened back when rock and roll came into the world. Now, some of y'all have been asking me my opinion about rock and roll music. Now, anyone who knows me knows that if you ask me my opinion about something, I'm gonna give you an answer. You may not agree with what I have to say, but I'm gonna tell you. Now, I firmly believe that Rock and roll music is sent to us straight from the devil himself. I believe that rock and roll music has been sent to us straight from the bowels of hell. Now, I don't believe that the devil can do this work by himself. I think he has to have agents, assistants, evil agents to help spread this evil music. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the likes of uh, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and many, many other performers who help him spread this evil music. When they start singing, and they start dancing, and they start gyrating their body parts, I believe it leads our young people to one place. I believe it leads them in a direction they don't need to go. And where is that place? Brothers and sisters, I'm talking about lust of the flesh. Now the good book and the good Lord, they tell us to avoid lust of the flesh at all costs. Now, if we give in to lust of the flesh, brothers and sisters, you might as well go down to the Greyhound bus station and buy you a one-way ticket straight to hell. So yes, back in the late 50s and early 60s, rock and roll was going to send us to hell. But I was thinking about this the other night. And uh, what rock and roll music did back in the 60s was it also helped create a social movement. And in that way, it's very similar to social media these days. 
because a lot of people have said that social media is a horrible thing. It causes kids to get lost and it just, you know, become victims to predators. And there's all these horrible things about social media. But over the past few years and currently, just in the past few weeks, social media has also been a way to bring people together in order to be able to create change. I think about what happened in Egypt a few years ago, and I think about what's happening now, is that without this, we wouldn't be able to have come together to start to try and create social change around racism in this country if we didn't have the means of connecting with each other through technology. And it was rock and roll music that was something that brought people together in the late 60s and um, we're looking at things back then, such as racism and war and all of those things. So a lot of times the things that people look at as seeing a problem end up also being a way to change the world in some really wonderful ways and to bring people together. So I also, when I started doing this before COVID, I did a survey. There's a group out there on Facebook called Self Care for Advocates. And if you're not a member of it, I would suggest that you go to, say, say, to Facebook and look for Self Care for Advocates and ask to become a member. Please ask the questions that they ask you to, to um, answer for to get in as a member. But I asked them, I said, tell me some pros and cons about using social media for self-care. And one person said right out, she says, it helps my self-care. There's the pictures of nature and animals and kids being cute and people doing funny and silly things. And it was a way for her to distract herself from the things that she was having to deal with because the self-care for advocates is a lot of people who are working in domestic violence and sexual assault, but they're also social workers and people that are working in other places, uh, child advocacy and all of that. But another person said that it gets in the way of their self-care, that that mindless scrolling, they're not really present and they're, it increases their impatience and then that they, it just feels like they're doing nothing. And that for a long time they were able to escape work demands by going out into nature but now this person is taking their phone as he, and even checking in on the phone feeling like they should be productive or checking in even while they're in nature and that is in a lot of ways that product needing to be productive and checking in that technology piece has become one of the more difficult things about having technology at our disposal is that we are expected by the people that we work for, work with, to be constantly plugged into technology, to be easily reachable. And so when we are even trying to take that walk or that bike ride, I know every so often while I'm out on my bike, I hear a text come in and I have to remind myself, you do not have to stop and check that text. You can wait till you get home. Because of the only reason I bring my phone is just in case I need to get help if something happens. But I've, I've, I know that sometimes that'll go off. Maybe I should silence my phone while I'm on my bike ride. I just thought of that. But it's that, it's that understanding that we don't need to be productive 100% of the time. If I was giving another presentation, I would talk about that need to be productive is actually a part of a white supremacist culture. And we are buying into that. And it's something that um, I really encourage you to take a look at as how white supremacist culture encourages us to be perfect, to be productive, to be doing all of these things based on white supremacy and how there are other ways to live. And when we have those expectations of ourselves, we, we have those expectations of other people. On the other hand, I believe it or not, I am an introvert. And I see there in the middle, this really stuck out to me. Being an introvert allows me to care about humanity and despise human beings simultaneously. 
So I can get on Facebook and I can read about everything that's going on, but then I also find myself getting very, very upset with the world because of all the drama, anger, hate mongering that we see on social media. Sometimes it really does become too much. And it's still that balance. If it wasn't for people using their phone to take pictures of these things, if it wasn't for um, the videos that we see of things that are happening in the moment, maybe a lot of this social change wouldn't be happening because we would be less aware of it. So all of this goes into it too. I think that's one thing that came up for me over the past couple of months and how my presentation has changed over what I really wanted to talk about to what I really want to talk about now is how stay, being plugged into social media keeps us more informed about what's going on in the world. And then there's FOMO. The fear of missing out is real. And again, that ties us into that need to be productive that need to know about everything. It's that if my boss can't get a hold of me, I'm gonna miss out on something that maybe I should be doing. Or if my friends can't get a hold of me, I'm gonna miss out on something that sounds fun and exciting. And so people are experiencing this when in the past, how did we know that anything was happening? We usually found out about it after the fact, but now we are in this place where we're fearing that there's something happening right now that I should either be participating in or I should be attending to. And that puts a lot of extra stress on us. And I just want you to think about, is there are ways that we can cut ourselves off from this? So this is our first poll. I'm going to just ask my facilitator to bring this up and I'll give you about a minute to go and answer. When are you most likely to check your social media? You know, a couple times a day, you don't have social media, once a day, only when you get alerts or you live on social media. So let's just see how this ends up. So most of you seem to be checking it a couple of times a day. Um, I really, for those that you've got, we've got four people, just 5% of you that don't have social media. And then we got a couple of people, six people who say only when they get alerts, but we've got about 25% of those of you that responded live on social media, which I take to mean that you're pretty much looking at your screen and checking your social media most of the time. I have to say, I probably fall into the category of I live on social media. I do have it where I can access it all the time. And I'm on there checking for news. I'm checking to see what other people are posting. I'm on there checking to just every once in a while just to distract myself. And I'm just not always sure that that's such a hot idea. But there's so much going on in the world right now. I have to admit, I get the FOMO and I wanna be able to check and find out what's happening. So it ends up coming to be with my desire to be well-informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. It, I do know that there are times that I have to take breaks from social media because there is this intense, there's so much intensity to it at times that for my own health and well-being, I do have to get away with it, get away from it. And I'm going to encourage you to start thinking about ways that you can do that for yourself also, because this is, there's so much to this. It's also a way to avoid what's going on in the rest of our lives. So I tried so hard to find some, some information on this, but I'm not quite sure we're there yet. But what people describe to me when they're flicking through their phone, that sort of mindless, you know, just flicking things up, is that they almost go into a dissociative state. And dissociation is sort of when your brain shuts down and you're not even quite sure of what it is that's, that you're doing, but you're just sort of lost. 
And it's a way to disengage from whatever's going on in your environment. And so that can, can be at any time. It's just a way to just be away from it. So I find that sometimes I can do that when I'm on social media or playing a game online, doing all sorts of things. It ends up being a way to avoid whatever else is going on that I possibly would want to do. It could be procrastination. It could be a, you know, try of something that I'm supposed to be doing to be productive, or it could be just, I don't want to deal with watching the news. I don't want to talk to people. This is just a way that I can avoid engaging with the world. We think about walk through an airport and look at everyone who is sitting waiting to get on their flight. They are all flicking through social media. It was amazing to me about how there was one year when I had to travel and there were no places to plug in your devices. And the next year, everywhere I went to travel, they had these ports to plug in your devices everyone, everywhere so people could you know, make sure that their devices were charged. But no one's talking to each other. They're not learning about people from other places. They're not just checking in with each other. It's become a way to the only people that you're engaged with are the people in your phone. So there was a we yeah. we have a question from Elizabeth. She wanted to know if the dissociative state you're talking about caused by scrolling social media um, could also be similar to when folks watch TV for long periods of time. Yes. And it all depends on what you're doing. Um, it's that if I think of Netflix binging is, is one thing, is that you sit there and you don't even realize that you're going right into the next episode and you're just sort of there watching, you know, continuing to watch the show. I think of in, in how it's related to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma, is I had a father who was a veteran of the Korean War and I didn't realize this until I was older and was studying about trauma and dissociation. But what my father did through the 60s and 70s is, and probably even further than that, is he watched a lot of war movies. He would watch John Wayne war movies, not the, not the Westerns, but he would watch anything that had to do with war, documentaries on war. And he was... I, could, I can say now, looking back, he was in a dissociative state watching these because there was a part of him that was just trying to process it on some level, but he would go into this space that it was just complete avoidance of everything else. And I see that with other people who, with watching television and the binging and everything, everything in moder anything in moderation is good, but when we take it too far and we are binging 10 episodes of something, then it's sort of like taking a look at what was I trying to avoid during that period of time. Thank you for that question, Elizabeth. So there was a study done a few years ago where it showed that um, a half of a million, half a million eighth through 12th graders we're exhibiting high levels of depressive symptoms in, and it increased by 33% between 2010 and 2015. And in that same period, the suicide rate for girls in that age group in, increased by 65%. So what was going on during that period of time between 2010 and 2015, that depression increased by 33% and suicide rate for girls in that age group increased by 65%. They were correlating it. It's not a causality. It was co they're correlating it to smartphones being introduced in 2007. And by 2015, fully 92% of teens and young adults owned a smartphone. The rise in depressive symptoms correlates with smartphone adoption during that period even when matched year by year, okay? 
And I found this information on childmind.org. Um, it was done, this research was done at San Diego University, that as cell phone usage has risen, so has depression and suicide rates. The same study showed that girls who interact intensely offline, who have a large social network offline and still engage in social media, their increase in depressive symptoms is not as great because they're also having that in, those interactions in real life. It's just not all through social media. But there's some teenagers who don't connect as well offline because they're isolated or don't feel accepted in schools and communities. And for those kids, having that electronic connection can be life-saving. So they still have a way to connect with each other. So it's about recognizing that some people have that, if you have that access to real life relationships, that's gonna help keep their depression symptoms down. But also that if you don't have access because of being isolated geographically, that you're going to be able to connect with some people and that can be actually life-saving for you. So it does, have its good points and its bad points. So since March of this year, here's another poll. How has your internet usage, has it increased? Um, where has it increased? Have you been on social media more? Are you on news websites? Is it meeting websites for work? chatter, text for maintaining contact with friends and family, or are you seeing that your internet usage hasn't increased? So as I suspected, it's meeting websites for work. People are on Zoom. We've just, there's, you know, I've started calling myself a Zoomer Boomer or a Boomer Zoomer because, you know, it's just something you get to, you figure this out. But it, it looks like about the same you know, our people, people have increased their usage in social media and news websites and chat, meeting with family and friends, but about 5% of you, and I sort of suspect that that may be the few people who aren't on social media, their, inter, their internet usage hasn't increased at all. So thank you for answering that poll, but you know, we just, it's a nice idea to see how things are moving along there. So I pulled up some data to compare January 2019 to January 2020. And so the total population of mobile users was 67% in both that time, in both January 2019 and 2020. Um, it just, Internet users just increased a couple of percentage points, and social media users went up about four percentage points. But here, during COVID, smartphone phone use is now 76%. Let me go back here, where it was 67%. Desktop computers, smart TV, game consoles, 17%, smartwatch. People are using more time on their devices in recent weeks. And these are internet users age 16 to 64. Now this was in April, and I have to admit that for some of these laptop computer, desktop computer, tablet devices could have been people who are having to access schoolwork during that time. So that internet usage would have brought that up. Um, so it's about what I would be really interested in knowing probably in another six months is what was the difference between April and May of this year? And then what happens as stay at home orders decreased and how much are people how much less would people be using these services in order to just feel a part of the world? I also wonder if we have 
another surge during the winter of the virus, how much greater this would be if the weather's not as good. Fortunately, we had a decent spring, so people were able to still get out and go for walks and things like that. But it's just all going to be interesting to see what happens as this moves along. So Zoom, as our poll sh showed, more people are on the internet in order to have meetings for work, whether it's Zoom or I think there's Microsoft Meeting, there's probably Google Groups, all of these things are happening. And so there's this thing called Zoom Gloom and Zoom Boom. And for this, I need to just get out my notes a little bit. I thought this was interesting. Zoom Gloom is a lot of people have said, I'm so exhausted at the end of the day and all I'm doing is sitting and looking at a screen. I'm not doing anything physical. Why am I so tired at the end of the day? Well, they found just by the way we've always related with each other is we really respond a lot to visual cues. So it's, um, Zoom, so Zoom Gloom has to do with looking at all of these pictures of people. You've got, you could have, you know, I've been in rooms where there's been 25 people up in front of me on the screen and you can't connect with the visual cues on everybody because they're so small, you can't read their eyes, you can't necessarily see all of their body language, but there is a part of our brain that is trying to connect in that way but can't do it in the same old way. So there's the loss of the verbal cues. You're talking to people, but there may be somebody on the screen. I know for me, it's, it's, I've got my laptop that I'm looking at now, but I've got a larger screen to my left. So sometimes I know I have to be careful because I can be on a meeting and it looks like I'm not paying attention, but I'm actually looking at the larger screen so I can see people's faces better. But if I was a speaker, I would feel like somebody wasn't paying attention. And when you're, sometimes when you're in a Zoom room with people, people forget that people can see them and you do things in a Zoom room that you wouldn't do if you were around a meeting table, um, having a meeting at your workplace. So we're spending a lot of time in our heads trying to um, listen, get cues of what's going on to pe with people, and we're trying to decode more faces. Instead of just looking at one person while they're talking, we have a group of people that we're looking at, and our brain is trying to decode all that messages at one time, and trying to navigate chat, trying to do all of these things, and by the end of the day, we are exhausted. We don't realize that all of this is happening in our brain. It's just happening there because we're having to pay attention to too many things at one time. So it just causes a, a brain drain because we're constantly being overwhelmed. But there is some evidence that there, this is also a Zoom boon for people who are not neurotypical that for some folks who, are, who process things in different ways, that this gives them the opportunity to just be able to not engage as much. It's less anxiety provoking. They know when it's their turn to talk. They don't have to wait for social cues, letting them know when to talk. So for someone who's not neurotypical, it actually could be less for them. I would like to hear from somebody who's non-neurotypical to find out how they're responding to it and if that's true, because I thought that was really interesting. Our brains over time, if we are kept in this situation of having to meet via Zoom for an extensive period of time, our brains are going to eventually adapt. It will be an evolution, 
evolutionary shift in our brains to be able to manage being and having these types of meetings, um, just in the same way that we've shifted in so many other ways um, over the years. So it's interesting to me, you know, because I like brain science and I like the idea that there's going to be something shifting in our brains over the years that for some of you who are younger, who are still in your 20s, that by time you're even 30 or 40, your brain may readjust to being able to do this. Um, I can feel it already in that some people are finding it less draining, but at the beginning, there was a lot of the Zoom drain. Linda, I just want to point out on the Zoom chat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to read any of this out loud, but yeah. somebody did answer your question. Oh, great. I'm gonna, I can't get into the chat as a... Okay. Um, somebody said, I have ADD, auditory processing disorder, and hearing loss, and finding the online interactions much easier. You've been able to facilitate a Bible study early in COVID on social media without my usual difficulties. That's what, you know, thank you for validating that research that I read and I'm glad you shared that because um, I know for people who are neurotypical, we think that everybody's experiencing the same way, but I think it's really important to know. I think when we, I, and in fact, I don't even like the frame to say things as being neurotypical and non-neurotypical because I think the way that neurotypical brains are currently working are eventually going to evolve to work in ways very similar to non-neurotypical way brains are working. That's my opinion. And so I think it's all just sort of a, a process in how brains are evolving and that we shouldn't look at one being better than the other because I think some brains are just developing um, with the world at a different rate than others. I think that's where I'm at on that. But thank you for sharing that. Okay, so self-care. You can't pour from an empty cup, you have to take care of yourself first. We know that when we get on that airplane and they tell you that when the oxygen mask drops, you're supposed to put it on yourself before helping the person next to you. It's counterintuitive, but we still do it. We're told to do it because we really have to take care of ourselves. And there are apps for that. There are so many apps for self-care that I almost feel like it's another excuse to be plugged into our phones. So I just did some ch checking and I found out that there are a number of apps for hydration. I am really poor at staying hydrated, though I have found that at home working, I am better at it than I am at working in the office. I think it's just because I make myself a big thing of ice water and, and iced tea in the morning and I just have that all day long. But there are no apps to track hydration, which you know is so important, particularly as we come up on summer and people are on, in these incredibly hot days that we're having. And so there are plenty of apps out there. So I want to do another poll. And for what, which of the following reasons do you use apps? And I, I know one that's missing here that I should have put in, but let's see if that comes up in the chat box. Music, gaming, fitness tracking, hydration, sleep, relaxation, scheduling and reminders. And if there's anything I don't have listed up there, um, Go ahead and put it in the chat box. Not the Q&A, but in the chat box. And then Maddie will get back to me with anything. I suspect there's one, the one that I didn't put on here that I thought of last night was podcasts. I think podcasts are something that people are really using um, apps for a lot because there's so many great podcasts out there. And I'm just going to start listing off. We have a lot of people answering in the chat. Um, right. Looks like social media, books, podcasts, as you mentioned. Um, 
banking apps. Yeah. Shopping. <laughs> um, let's see. Meditation, coupons. Oh. Um, let's see. Shared shopping lists. Someone said self-care time. Nice. Um, personal development. News, current events, to-do lists. Audible ebooks. Yep. Nice. Um, someone said I don't use apps. Interesting. Cool. Um, Pinterest. And that doesn't use social media. Yeah. <laughs> People just don't. Um, ooh, gardening. Gardening. Health tracker. Mm -hmm. Credit monitoring. Zumba. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that exists right now that doesn't have an app. I just, you know, yeah. it, it's amazing. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and just put the results up here. So we got a lot in chat of different things, but on those people that responded to the poll, it was for scheduling and reminders, um, sleep, a sleep app. I've thought of trying that. I'm just not quite sure how that would work. Some some of you are using the hydration apps, fitness tracking. Um, I think and music. That's that's the big one. I think that's where music has evolved evolved over the years. To you know, I grew up with 33s and 45 albums that you put on a turntable. Yes, I am that old. And eventually, I actually had an eight track tape, tape player in my car at one time. If you don't know what that is, look that up or ask a parent or grandparent. To CDs, to now it's like I've been looking for a CD of a particular group and the only thing I can find is an MP3. So it's, it's getting harder and harder. So it's, it's amazing how so much stuff has that you're accessing it via your smartphone and your computer. And it's, it's to the point that I can't say to people, you shouldn't be on your computer so much when now we have so much that's on the, our computers that we are having to do. And I love shopping. Shopping has been a big thing over the past couple of months. Retail therapy. Um, just as an aside, I know when I've had a bad, when I had a bad week, like I would know last week was a bad week by the number of Amazon boxes that are piled up next to my mailbox the following, in the next couple of days. That's just retail therapy is there. So that's interesting. I'm glad, I'm glad you shared in the chat, which is that you're, so, if you want to, and this keeps Maddie really busy, I really like you to just name some apps that you use for self-care. Not your music apps, not, but if you have apps that you use primarily for self-care, like sleep apps, um, relaxation apps, I think hydration apps, let's just share some of those in the chat so everyone has a chance to see what some of the popular apps are out there. And Maddie's going to have to read them to me. All right, they are coming in quick. So I will start. Looks like there's an app called Calm. Um, another okay. one, Down Dog. That must be a yoga one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Headspace. Um, Hollow. Let's see. Fitbit, my fitness pal, sanity and self. I like that. Yeah. Smiling mind for meditation. Sounds great. Um MediSafe, med medication management app. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, health balance blood pressure tracker. Rain for sleeping noise. Um May My Walk. Okay. <laughs> um, tone it up. That must be another fitness app. Yeah. Um, a white noise generator. Yep. Um, all trails for hiking. Yeah. Um, crystal bowls. 
Yes, that's mm. you have the crystal bowls and you make them ring and you get different bones to them. And mm. it's a real nice meditation. So but that's wonderful. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, wow, there's like still okay, still coming in. 21 called 10%. Um run keeper. Do it amazes me how many different apps that there are out there. Thank you for sharing. You yeah. can be adding those in the in the in there for the other people who are on on this on this call, but it it's it's gotten to the point where I think when I think of something that I want to do, I start check to see if there's an app for that. I'm surprised nobody talked about recipes, cooking, looking up things, um, you know, new recipes, because they're saying a lot of people, particularly over the past couple of months, have, start, have started cooking more, baking more. They've basically run out of flour in some grocery stores because people are baking more bread. So I can imagine that there are probably some, some apps out there with rep recipes and or looking at cooking videos on YouTube, all of those things. Okay. I think, okay, great. So I wanted to talk a little bit about real self-care versus fake self-care. And I found this great list uh, from Whitney Hawkins Goodman. And so real self-care is fueling your body with food that gives you energy and helps you improve your mentality physically, mentally and physically. It doesn't mean you can't have ice cream. It means that you have those foods in uh, moderation and you're just recognizing that eating is to fuel, fuel your body so that you can think better and work and your body can work better physically. Fake self-care, I really like this, is not dieting. Dieting is, um, I think that also has a tendency to fall into the white supremacist culture. It is in body image. It's about the way that we see how our body is supposed to be, rather than recognizing that we want our body to be able to work for us in ways that we can think clearly and be able to move. But dieting culture has, can become a real stringent, it's very judgmental, and we want to be really careful with that. Drinking water, being kind to yourself, those are both real self-care versus, uh, well, I'll get to those over there. Spending pe time with people who enrich your life is very good self-care. Making sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who care about you and that you care about them, that you learn things from them, that you're not constantly getting into political arguments with them, but yet that can be some stimulation that you need now and then, but not all the time. Treating yourself to something new because you love yourself. Okay, not because you're stressed out. Okay, so it's okay that I'm getting a package today from Amazon with some new acrylic pens so I can do some artwork because I really love myself and love to do some art. But if I was doing that because I needed to just get rid of some stress by shopping, that would be a whole different thing. And then moving your body because you can. Versus, as you see on fake self-care, working out as a punishment or attending a class that shames your eating habits or appearance. That somebody's, you know, it's the old, um, I can't, the, you know, when you're in, you've got those trainers that you see on TV that are just yelling at you and shaming you. If you buy yourself stuff that tells you that you're going to love yourself more if you have this product, Socializing because of fear of missing out, that's not, that's fake self-care. Saying yes to everyone because you're a nice person, that's fake self-care because you're not setting up boundaries. And I took this directly as she said it, talking shit to yourself to motivate you. Don't say, don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to your best friend that you love forever. You don't want to say to yourself, all these horrible things to get you motivated. And alcohol and drugs, you know, just being careful in their usage. That's, you know, sometimes, you know, I say, what are you doing for self-care? And somebody will say, well, I drink, I drink a glass of wine at, when I get home at night. That's fine. 
If you're drinking a bottle of wine, that's a whole other discussion. So it's about being careful and having things in moderation. So it's just recognizing, is this something that is really gonna make your life better and is taking care of you? Or is it something that's bringing you down and there are things of that about yourself that you don't feel good about afterwards? Or if you miss a day, like I miss a day of working out and you're shaming yourself for that, or you have a little extra ice cream one day and it messes up your diet, again, that's not self-care. It's about, are you doing this because it's a, a way to treat yourself or to take care? Does somebody have a question? Because again, we've got a raised hand. If you've got a raised, if you need to ask a question, please do that in the Q&A. Natalie, do we have any questions in the Q&A? Hey, Linda. Um, so we do have one. I don't know if you want to save it to the end, but um, Kimberly asked if you have any tips for um, kids and teens and technology use to form healthy habits rather than um, letting technology use them. Well, there's a lot of apps and there's programs out there to make sure to just put timeouts on screens to be able to say, you know, it's going to close out after a certain time. This is an ongoing topic that there's a lot of research out there on, particularly for parents and, and just trying to figure out how much screen time is too much. So I, I have to say I'm not an expert in that and I haven't done much research on that but I'm certain that there's plenty of information out there. Um, I would probably go back to childmind.org where I got some of that information earlier and see if they have any information on that and uh, we'll see what we have. Okay so I'm a big fan of appless self-care so, but as I say that, I have to, I have to be, I have to admit, I can't lie to you. When I'm out hiking or riding my bike, I'm using my Garmin, my fitness tracker. So is that really appless self-care? If I have to, and so I got myself thinking on that. Do I really need to track my miles? Do I need, really need to track my heart rate? I know how far 15 miles is. Do I really need to have something to record that every day? I'm just having that conversation with myself as I'm sitting here talking to you on Zoom. Just wondering. But there are other things. You don't need a, a, an app to help you breathe. You just do a triangle breath while you're sitting in your chair. You just sit tall with that straight spine or you lie down on your back and you inhale through your nose for a count of four. You hold it at the top of that inhale for a count of four. Exhale for a count of four. And then do that a couple of times. It doesn't need to be 10 minutes. It just needs to be a few times just to oxygenate your system and you don't necessarily need an app for that. It's something you can do while you're just sitting in your chair. Just four counts in, hold for four, four counts out, and repeat. And that will just help reduce some of that anxiety that comes from fear of missing out, that comes from reading about everything that's going on in the world, about it can calm you down if you're just spending a whole lot of time flicking through your screen. Another thing you can do is the five senses exercise. You can find both the breath and the five senses exercise on an app, but why? <laughs> when you can just remind yourself that you can sit and think, of, look around and name five things that you can see four things that you can feel, three things that you can hear, 
two things you can smell and one thing that you can taste. And what that, this exercise does is it grounds you into the present. It brings you back to where you are so that your brain's not all over the place. If you're doing on it, that on an app, you've got your device in front of you, you're doing this, and as soon as you're done, you go back to whatever was stressing you out on the device. So I would prefer, this is just me, that you put the device aside and do something that's not connected to the device to reduce your anxiety. And then allow yourself a few minutes without the device, if what's going on on the device is what's making you anxious. I also like these finger holds. I actually have used these quite a bit, um, where you just sort of grasp on the, to, the, to the finger that corresponds with how you're feeling. And you do that for about a minute and it activates some of those pressure points that we know from acupressure and it can calm you down. And you can also just rub the palm of your hand if, you, if you're like, oh, oh, I'm feeling all of those things. And just do that in the palm of your hand to help you relax. And so just having some things that you don't, that you can use to help manage your self-care that you don't need the app to do. And I am done. And here is my email address if anybody would like to contact me with questions or um, if you want a link to anything that I talked about. And I'm just gonna check in with my volunteers, is, are there any questions or comments that need to be addressed before we end this today? Yeah, so um, we currently don't have any new questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any in the chat. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. I don't know if my um... you've got a lot of thank yous. Yeah. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Linda. Y'all have a good day, and I hope y'all have you know find some ways to take care of yourself that don't necessarily keep you plugged in. <laughs>